Let's try that one more time. Good morning, everybody. So guess what? We are one Sunday closer to Christmas. We're getting very, very close, and I hope you are all as excited as I am about that. Would you please stand and join us with all of the angels in heaven in praising God and bringing glory to Him? Welcome to Prairie Bible Church this morning. Welcome to the beautiful wintry, snowy scene that we woke up to this weekend. Isn't it great? Okay, isn't it nice to have snow for a couple weeks in December, right? We don't need to have it all winter, but maybe a couple weeks is nice. Uh, We're thrilled that you're able to be here with us this morning. <clears throat> and I hope that you enjoy this next 60 minutes and the chance to worship together and worship our God and our King. As a reminder, I remind myself that the one of our principles here is just what Jesus taught us, to live by the Bible and live by what Jesus taught us. And he reminded us that the two greatest commandments was to one, the first greatest commandment, Jesus said, was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm thrilled that we can come together as neighbors and as friends and as brothers and sisters in Christ to love one another today and every day. And as we do that, if you are new to Pray Bible Church, we hope that you feel that welcome, feel that uh, connection and that neighborly love that we come together with. And it's also a great reminder for myself and for others here that it's not just a pair of us in the building that are worshiping together. But as we have done recently, remember that we've got great family and friends and brothers and sisters of Christ that are worshiping with us right now online. And there's a camera right above the door in the back. And as we have done in the past, I want to include them. And we're going to recognize how great and thrilled that they are that they were able to worship with us this morning. So if you would, with a second, just turn around with me and wave to those that are worshiping with us this morning on camera. And welcome them to service as well this morning. And we are glad that you are here as well and hope that you can enjoy this experience, whether you're doing it live or even if you watch this uh, recorded throughout this coming week. I want to invite uh, Pat Bunch to come up. She's going to share a little bit about a disciple opportunity that we have uh, coming here in the next, in the coming year, uh, to which she can share a little bit about that uh, program. Sorry, I'm going to borrow this. Uh, a Disciples Pathway Bible study that she's going to share. Good morning. As Tom said, I'm Pat Bunch. Um, Ron and I are going to offer a, a study after the first of the year, starting on the 6th of January, running through the 9th of February, Wednesday evening, 6.30 to 8 p.m. A Disciples Path is a study that um, has meant a great deal to both of us as we've participated in this with the actual author of the study. 
The lessons will include six different um, paths that we'll be studying and working on, and they will include um, the definition of a disciple, uh, the use of the Bible, uh, the presence and importance of connecting with Christians, our gifts, understanding financial generosity, and also our spiritual gifts to recognize the difference between a volunteer and a servant in our church community. And then service and witness by learning our style for invitational uh, evangelism. I will pray that you will all consider this study as part of your, your winter uh, activities. Uh, it's already snowing. <laughs> Pandemic hasn't left yet. So we're kind of stuck at home, and uh, I'm thinking this would be a great way for us to get together here at church for an hour and a half Wednesday nights um, and, and just see what it is that we can do to enrich our <coughs> disciples' path. Um, it's a journey that if, uh, if you're ready to take it, I think you will enjoy it, and I would encourage you to participate. There's a sign-up sheet in the back by the barn that we would like to have you sign up with your name, your email address, and your phone. Um, we've ordered books already, but if we need to order more books, we'd be more than happy to do that. So, so do sign up early and let us know. There are two books you will need to, to get to participate in that. And there will be a little bit of homework, but what do you have to do in the winter anyway, right? So, so let's do that and let's enjoy it and uh, all become disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Pat. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me that um, we've, been, we've said many times that we as Christians are called for three main things. Lots of things, but three main things. Worship, discipleship, and service. And this is just a great opportunity that Ron and Pat are going to help lead in ways that we can grow in our discipleship. Learning more about Jesus and then how we can share that with others in that teaching. So thanks for bringing that. And we look forward to being able to see how that helps us as a church grow in the next coming months and years as well. A uh, reminder, again, just with the snow, it helps us remember as more that we are in the Advent season and uh, that Christmas is upon us uh, and that as we come into that, a couple of things coming up. Uh, Christmas Eve service, which happens to be December 24th this year. I know, bad joke. My kids hate it when I do that. <clears throat> We're going to have two services here on December 24th. One is a 4 o'clock service led mostly by our youth telling the Christmas story and giving them a chance to share in that Christmas story with us. And the second one is a 6 o'clock candlelight service here at, service, at, at church as well. We're going to have a choir um, that our volunteer leader, John, is going to lead and us in choir. We're going to have two simple rehearsals, and if you want to be a part of that choir, we'd love for you to do it. Next Sunday after service, they're going to practice, December 20th, about 11 o'clock, or when service is over, choir is going to practice. If you want to be a part of that, grab John or Jesse, let him know, or just stick around after service then. And then the second one will be December 24th, in the afternoon, 2 o'clock, right? There'll be just two practices for choir. We'd love it if you want to participate just to be able to share that joy of Jesus in this Christmas season. And the second thing is, next Sunday, we're going to have a little bit of a caroling sing-along. I hope I get this right, Jesse. But during service, an a cappella caroling sing-along that we can all share in the Christmas songs we love. And so those that are going to be leading us in choir, we may invite you to recruit you ahead of time to come up here in front next Sunday, even during service, just the basic Christmas caroling sing-along. So be prepared for that. We'd love for it if we can get a few people to come up here and kind of help lead all of that as we're going through it. So we're looking forward to that in the next couple of weeks and the joy that ultimately helps remind us of the birth of Jesus that we get to celebrate in this coming couple of weeks. For those of you who were here last week, just a real quick update um, from our annual or quarterly meeting that we had as a church. We were thrilled from the turnout that people were able to stay, we were able to talk and get some discussions about those things, but also wanted to point out and thank everyone for the barn and the angel tree barn, if you will, the red barn out back. And there were some tags on there to help look at funding the renovations of the building as we continue. And we were thrilled to say that as of last Sunday, only nine of the 40 tags remained. Many, many people took those and were excited, people were excited about that and how that continued to lead our church to continue to grow to build and be able to share Jesus' message here in the world, in the community. So we're thrilled by that. And just want to say thank you for people being a part of that and looking forward to the future of Prairie Bible Church. Whew. Now, as we get into a time to really worship our Lord and Savior, would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every day. But I thank you especially for this day. 
the chance to not only worship you, but to come with my brothers and sisters that love you as well. To be together, to share with one another, to support one another, and ultimately to, to praise you for your glory and your majesty and for being our king. Lord, I pray for those that aren't here with us this morning, that they would feel that present, your presence. As you've said, where two or more gather, you are there. But we also know, Lord, that even if someone's watching us online by themselves, you are there. You're surrounding them. You are everywhere. And you love us each and every minute, each and every second of each and every day. We thank you for that blessing. And as I've said before, Lord, and I've reminded myself weekly this year, well, it's been a unique year. Well, it's been a challenging year where there's been a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. A lot of change in our routines, a lot of change in our repetition. The one thing that's always been consistent is you. Your presence and your love. All we have to do is ask. And you will surround us with your loving arms and we are so thankful for that. We know that if we will follow you, Lord, you continue to guide us in the direction we should go. Lord, I pray for this, this church, for your church, that we can be a representation of you into the world. As we share your message with those we come in contact with, those that are struggling, that, that, that don't know what's going on in our world, but we can shine a light, whether it be talking about our church, whether it be talking about Jesus, or whether just giving them a hug and showing them love, that they will know we are Christians by our love. And we pray, Lord, that this church can be a church for our community, for a church for all, that they, we can show them your love. And remind us that during this Christmas season, Jesus, that it is your time. It's a time when all the world recognizes your birthday. Isn't that awesome? And yet even though some of them maybe don't want to recognize it as Jesus' birthday, they celebrate that holiday. And it's a great end for us to tell your story, to tell our story, and to tell how important you are in our life. Lord, I pray for this past week of friends of mine, that have gone through pain, that have gone through loss of life, close loved ones. And I pray that you're with them and loving them as so many here in our family continue to go through. We pray for each and every concern, each and every challenge that people have here this morning. That although we don't list them all, you know our hearts. You know our pains. And I pray that you would be with them. I pray, Lord, for this worship service and this great time that we have together. That you would enjoy the song that we can sing to you. That you would bring us your words through your messengers. And truly be the light in our life. That the Christmas story reminds us of that great star that you brought to this earth. We ask that you continue to bring us this purpose as we go out into this world from this place this week. And let us shine like that beautiful North Star to those around us. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So we know from this year the words Job spoke so long and long ago in Scripture that God gives and God takes away. But we always want our hearts to continue to say that the Lord is blessed because ultimately we have a hope in a future in Jesus Christ. So would you please stand and join us in acknowledging that hope and saying that the Lord is blessed.
had a lot of things to say about himself and had a lot of names for himself, such as the Son of Man, the King of Kings. But one of the most intimate names I believe he had for himself was Shepherd, the Good Shepherd. And he talks a lot about that, especially in the book of John. I'm going to be reading a passage for you that talks about how Jesus intends to lead us to a place of hope and of peace and of life. The words will be on the screens behind me, and I encourage you to read along with me. It says, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. He's going to give us a vision for a brighter future. Would you please sing with us? Be thou. Be thou my vision. O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that Thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence by light. Thou my wisdom and Thou my true word, I ever with Thee and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father and I Thy true Son, Thou in me dwelling and I with Thee one. Be 
Riches I heed not, nor men's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou in the only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. You may be seated. Good morning, kids. If you want to come up, I have a short children's message. Come on up. Good to see so many of you. Oh, you're jingling up. I love it when you jingle up. I have a couple more. All right. Yes. Now, today I brought a gift, and I was going to tell you guys a little bit about this gift, but I can't tell you what it is because it might be for somebody we all know. Um, but when I was thinking about picking out this gift, I was just asking myself, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a, a person that's a little bit harder to shop for, and gift giving is sometimes tricky for me. So I was just asking myself, what can I get for this person? And I asked the Lord, what could I share with this person? And then I was, I was thinking about it, and I got some inspiration, and I'm so excited to give this gift. I, it, it took me a while to, to think of what to give, but I can't wait for them to open it and be excited about it. And I was wondering if you guys had any gifts that you, has anybody done any Christmas shopping and bought any gifts or sh thought of a gift that they're going to give? Oh, good. I have a couple that are giving gifts. Do any, any thoughts that you guys can share about your gifts, maybe without giving it away in case? Are we, are we purchasing for parents or siblings? What, what were some ideas about our gifts? Or we're not sharing? I understand. We have to keep them secret so we get the surprise. But what about, what about God? Does God give us gifts Yes, I see a couple heads nodding. Yes, God gives gifts. And are his gifts good? Always. God's gifts are always, always good because he is a good God. I wanted to share a little bit about what that magnitude of the gift that God gave us, his greatest, greatest gift. Do you guys know what God's greatest gift to each and every one of you was? What was God's greatest gift? Help me out. Um, God's greatest gift to you. Mr. Noah. Jesus. Absolutely. That was God's greatest gift. That was a gift that was wrapped up in a manger that was laying in hay or straw. And this is what the Lord tells us in the book of John. He says, for God so loved the world, that's me and you, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So that means that he gave us his most very, 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 very precious gift of all. And it wasn't a shopping experience. It was from his heart. He gave it to you. And the best thing about that, you guys, we didn't do anything to deserve it. In fact, we probably shouldn't have received that gift. But he gave us his very, very best gift because he loves you. So when you guys are giving gifts, when you're thinking about what you're going to give, when you're wrapping, when you're getting ready for your friends and family to open the gifts that you gave, remember the greatest gift that we all received. And there's a lot of people in this world that don't know that greatest gift that Noah showed, shared with us. Jesus, the greatest gift. And use that opportunity to tell the story. Tell more than the story that we have just wrapped up in paper here. The story's so much bigger and so much better. 
you guys, we are going to make, in Kids Life Groups today, we're going to make something that's going to help you guys tell the story. So I can't wait to share that with you. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatest gift of all. Please let us never, ever forget, and please give us the words to tell your story over and over again to everyone we meet. May they all know the love and hope that you are and that you gave us in your son, Jesus Christ. And all kids said, amen. I'm Hannah Hughes, and today I will be reading our scripture from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire world. This was the first census taken while Quinarius was governor of Syria. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Lord Jesus. Thank you for a beautiful, sunshiny day. I even want to thank you for the snow out there today and for the privilege that we have uh, in this Christmas season to come together to celebrate you and to remember that in the midst of all that is life, there is hope, there is joy, and there is purpose. Sometimes it's easy to forget that, Jesus, when we find ourselves in the middle of all the stuff that this year has been in particular, but fact of the matter is it's sometimes easy to forget all of that in the midst of just life. So um, we thank you for reminding us what, um, what is available to us as children of the King. We claim the promise that is found in Isaiah 55, 11. This is truly when it is your words that go out, they shall not come back empty. And it's my prayer today, Lord, that the words that I would speak would be your words and if there's anything that I might be inclined to say that is not of you, that you just befuddle my mind. That shouldn't be, take too much work. Um, so uh, just let only your words be proclaimed and may your message be received. May it take root in us and produce fruit through us for the sake of a world that needs to know that there is hope, that there is light, there is purpose and joy to be found in this world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for becoming one of us. Thank you for dying on the cross, and thank you for rising again. In your holy name, amen. If uh, last week you may have heard the message that I shared, and in that message I shared that um, prospective brides hate curveballs. Remember that? Um, well, I am of the opinion that prospective moms hate curveballs even more. Let me tell I'll give you an example. When my, uh, when my wife was pregnant, uh, I noticed that while she was pregnant, especially in the third trimester of her pregnancy, she had a tendency to become kind of like a mama bear. And she didn't want, she was so careful about what she did, who she hung out with, what she was doing. Every, she was just, she just was this very, she didn't, she didn't want anything that was going to be unexpected coming her way. And if there's anything that she could do that could keep that, those unexpected curveballs from coming, she would, she would take the precaution. Um, she, my wife loves um, traditional family Christmases for example, but when, in the third trimester of her pregnancy, she would often hesitate whether we would go home for Christmas because for fear that something might happen that she, and she'd be away from her doctors and um, all that legitimate stuff. Now, me, because I'm a man, I would think when, when she was pregnant with Simon in particular, we lived in another state, so we were a long ways away from home, so I'm, I'm, I'll give you that, Lisa. 
But I remember, I remember thinking when, when she was questioning whether we should go home for the holidays, I was thinking, Lisa, you know the route that we take to get from where we live to home, and there's probably not any period more than a half hour away from a, a hospital or a doctor. So if anything were to happen, we'd be okay, right? Now, Emil's looking at me like, you are a dummy. <laughs> I, am, I may look stupid, but I didn't say that to her. Because you don't poke a pregnant bear. I figured if she, if she would have to come to those conclusions on her own, they, she wasn't going to hear them from me, basically, right? See, I'm not stupid. Okay, maybe I am, because there's been other times I have chosen to say things that I should not have said. And Anyway, that's a whole other sermon, but I'm not going to get into that. Now, here's, here's the problem. That's all good, well and good. But the problem is that no matter how careful we are, sometimes curveballs are thrown at us at the most inconvenient times, no matter what. So, um, whether you're pregnant or not, by the way. So this morning, as we continue um, in our sermon series called Christmas Curveballs, I'm going to tell you of a, a part of the Christmas story that was um, one of those inevitable curveballs that couldn't be avoided that Mary and Joseph had to experience that was part of the Christmas story. And as we, as we relive these curveballs with Mary and Joseph, we're going to ask the question, why? There's, there's a lot of nuance that goes along with that. But when we, when we relive these, these um, curveballs, I want you to be asking the question, why, as well. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, Hannah read the, the beginning of that for you, and um, um, I want you to have your Bibles open to that and kind of read the context, because there's gonna, I want, I'm going to be telling the story, but I want you to be checking up on me, because um, especially to see if there's things in the story that I'm not telling you about. That could be important. All right, in uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 1, what's it say? Basically, it says this. Luke chapter uh, 2, verse 1, it says that in those days, uh, a census was required in all the Roman Empire, right? That the emperor, or uh, uh, Quin Quinarius, is that right? Yep, governor, he says there's going to be a, uh, a census throughout all the Roman Empire, The question is, what was the purpose of the census? Well, you follow any rabbit trail and eventually it heads back to money, right? The purpose of the, of the uh, census was taxes, not a, uh, a topic that is, it, most people love to, to throw themselves into, but it was, it was all about money, it was all about taxes. But this was not just like the census that you all just filled out. It wasn't as simple as that. This census could not be just filled out and dropped in the mail. This was a census where they were required to go back to their ancestral homelands and register for the a census there. Now you think that's no big a that's no big deal. That doesn't sound like much of a curveball until you begin to realize that some of them had to travel long distances to go back to their ancestral homelands. Some of them had to travel 90 miles, which was the distance between uh, Bethlehem and Nazareth, where Mary and Joseph lived. Now you're thinking, 90 miles isn't that big a deal. When Lisa and I would go home for, for our holidays, 90 miles, we would have thought that was, that was easy. Until you begin to realize that the primary mode of transportation for that 90-mile trip was what? Your own two feet. Now, there may have been donkeys. We'll get to that. For the most part, it was, you, the, you got your feet. You're gonna, when was the last time any of you walked 90 miles? Raise your hands. Come on. I don't see any hands. It's been a while, hasn't it? Now, imagine that you're asked to go 90 miles and you're nine months pregnant. Whole other story, right? Okay, I've just set the stage for you. I've given you some context and I've kind of set up the living room for this conversation. Joseph comes home, and Mary is sitting with her feet up. She's nine months pregnant, right? 
Her ankles are swollen. I don't know where I would get an image like this, but her ankles are swollen and she doesn't look happy. She's been up on her feet all day long. She is uncomfortable. Ryan, can you relate to any of this, brother? She's uncomfortable. She's surly. And he knows he has to have a conversation with her. So he approaches the conversation um, gently. He walks up to her and he says, Honey, can I rub your feet? She says, leave me alone. She, he says, uh, have you seen the news today? Why? Well, uh, the governor had a news conference today. We've heard that. The governor had a news conference today, and apparently they've decided that there's going to be a census, and um, you have to travel back to your ancestral homeland, and and we've got to go to Bethlehem. But relax, don't overreact. Because I have, I've made this all good for you, Mary. Because I've talked to the neighbor, and they said we can borrow their donkey, right? Yeah, and and you, so you won't have to walk the 90 miles. You can ride on the donkey. How many of you have ridden on a donkey for the last for 90 miles? Raise your hands. Where nobody's raising their hands. My guess is, see, because, um, because uh, Joseph was a man, he thought he had solved the problem. And my guess is her feet were probably fine, other parts of her probably were not. Now, I want you to, first of all, let's stop right there for just a second, okay? We think we've been thrown curveballs this year, right? We talked about that last week. We have not experienced any curveballs compared to Mary. Which, by the way, begs the question we, I raised before, why? Why? Remember, I, I made the point that there's never been a curveball thrown that God didn't know was coming. I mean, I talked about that last week, right? So if God knew all these curveballs were going to be thrown, why didn't he do something about it? I mean, I can think about this in, specifically in relation to Mary and Joseph. I mean, I'm thinking this was a, most, the most delicate time in her life. And yet he allows this curveball for her, for her to have to go, on, because of a census, some silly, all about money, to have to go on a, a trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem when she's nine months pregnant. Why? And then I think, just when, I'm, when, I'm, when I think more selfishly about it, I think, why, did, why has he thrown us these curveballs this year? Why didn't he do so? If he knew they were coming, and if God is all-powerful and all-knowing, why didn't he do something about it? Those are good questions, and you should ask them. You should be asking them. And by the way, it's not ungodly for you to be asking those questions. It's okay. And I would go so far as to suggest to you that if you don't understand, which you probably don't, it's okay to be upset. So why did he allow that to happen to Mary and Joseph and Jesus why has he allowed this to happen to us? Well, I'm, I'm probably going to disappoint you to, a, to the degree that, honestly, I have no idea the answer to that question. Specifically, I mean. I don't know why. I don't know why we had a derecho. I don't know why we've had a pandemic, you know, fill in the blanks. And you guys, you could ask your own personal questions, right, of the stuff that's happened to you this year. I don't know the answer why. But I do have a couple of observations that I need you to hear. 
They'll maybe help you to understand and maybe, maybe give you hope and strength to keep believing. The first observation I would share with you is this. I believe that we Christians have a tendency to believe things that aren't true. For example, I think Christians have a tendency to believe that because we're Christians, our lives will be a bed of roses. I believe that Christians have a tendency to believe that because we walk the straight and narrow, because we live within God's good and perfect will, because, that's our, because we're choosing to or trying to, that things, our roads should be smooth. We shouldn't have to experience curveballs or, or inconveniences or problems or pain. That's what, we, that's what we believe. We don't say that generally. But we live like that's what we believe. And then when it doesn't happen, we think God is the one who has let us down. Listen to what I'm saying to you right now. Never. I know the Bible pretty well. I'm not as good a scholar as some people. But I know the, I know the Bible pretty well. And never in the Bible does it say that if you choose to live your life for Jesus, you will never have a problem. You will never have any heartache or pain. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say you won't, won't experience curveballs like the rest of the world. It doesn't say that. You want to know what it does say? I'll give you an example of what it says. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. I don't know if you know this one or not, but listen to this one. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, Consider it all joy, brothers and sisters, when, when you encounter various trials. It doesn't say, if you encounter various trials. It doesn't say, well, you might get a curveball thrown your way. You might experience it. No, it says when you have inconveniences and, and struggles and, and pain and, and brokenness and curveballs, when? Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, for trials will produce endurance, endurance will produce their perfect result that'll make you perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So basically, what God is saying is that all these curveballs that we experience, the pain and the, the hurt and the, the inconvenience, how, whatever, however you want to define it, that He never promised you wouldn't go through them. What He promised is that you will have the strength to go through them. Why? Because He's going to go through it with you. You don't have to do this by yourself. You weren't intended. You weren't built to do this by yourself. You weren't supposed to go through the experience, the curveballs, or the pain, the inconvenience, the trials, whatever you want to call it. You weren't intended to do that by yourself. He intended for, for you to say, walk with me. I want to walk with you. What he was saying is, that these curveballs have purpose. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, Mary and Joseph, what was the curveball they received we're talking about today? They were told what? They had no choice. It, it, there was no way to avoid this curveball. You have to travel 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem when your wife is nine months pregnant to register for a census. Curveball. What they didn't know was the why. Oh, they, they, they had the surface level whys, right? Well, because uh, Governor Quinerius said they had to do it. it was the, this, is why you, this was the census, right? And it, what they didn't know was the Why? Was, the God's, was God's why. What they didn't know was that the reason why this particular curveball was thrown at them was because they, God was fulfilling a prophecy. 
that is found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. They didn't know this at the time. This curveball was to fulfill the prophecy that says that, O little town of Bethlehem, out of you will arise a great leader that has been foretold of even from the ancient of days. What they didn't know was that this child that she was carrying must be born not in Nazareth, but in Bethlehem. All the while she's thinking, why in the world should I have to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem when I'm nine months pregnant? Well, because there a great leader shall arise out of Bethlehem that has been foretold of from the ancient. Now, that doesn't come as a curveball to you, does it? Because you've heard the story your whole life. Christians have been hearing the story for 2,000 years. They didn't have a clue. All they knew was that they had been thrown the most inconvenient and perhaps even dangerous curveball of their lives. You all have been thrown a few curveballs yourself, haven't you? And I'm not just talking about a pandemic and a derecho. And I'm talking about your stuff. How have you been dealing with it? Some of you have been doing okay, and others of you haven't been doing okay, and some of you have been doing okay at certain parts of the day or certain parts of the week, and not okay at other parts of the day or certain parts of the week. Why? Because you're human. So, let me give you a little advice, and this is for all of you, since some of you deal with it good in the middle of part of the day than you do at the, not the other end of the day, so it's probably for all of you, and me too. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, maybe today's the day to do it. And I'm telling you, it's not good enough. I mean, accepting Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior is not the same thing as having gone to church your whole life. Accepting Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior is not the same thing as, as, um, as serving meals under the bridge with Bridget. That's a good thing, but it's not the same thing. Accepting Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior is not the same thing as going to Sunday school or, or being a part of Ron and Pat's uh, discipleship. It's not the same thing. Accepting Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior is making the conscious decision to receive the invitation that God has offered to you to become part of the family. The invitation to be your hope, your light, your joy, and your salvation. If you've never done that, you need to. Now, a good lot of you are saying, well, I've already done that, and I've still got problems. Well, let me, let me tell you the other thing that I'm guessing if you're struggling you haven't done or you don't do on a regular basis. Yes, you need to give your life to Jesus. But you need to give your curveballs to Him too. You see, the thing we do as human beings, we, we oftentimes, when we get one of those things thrown at us, we, we hold on to it. We go, i got to just be strong enough to deal with it. Or, it hurt me. So I, I have the right to hang on to this hurt and this, this pain. And you do. If you want to, you can. And I see Christians doing this all the time. But you don't have to. What he wants you to understand, what he wants you to know, is that you have been given the opportunity to offer even the curveballs up to God. And when you do that, he doesn't promise that he's going to take away the pain or the hurt or the inconvenience or whatever else it is that you're struggling with. What he promises is that 
you'll be able to get through it. Because you'll get through it with him. You understand? There's, it's possible that some of you here are here today and you just need someone to pray with you. And we try to do this every week. We don't, we don't do it every week, but we try every week. If you need a prayer today, I'm going to be standing right over here by our prayer room. It's not marked, but it will be one day. I'm going to be standing right over there, and um, Jesse and the band are going to lead us in our final song of praise. And at any time, if you need a prayer with your pastor, I'll be standing right over there. What, doesn't, if you want to accept Christ or if it's something about one of your curveballs, whatever it is, I'd be honored to pray with you today, knowing that um, we don't do this by ourselves. We don't do any of this by ourselves. We get to do it with Jesus. If we think we know pain and we think we know struggle, I can guarantee you that our Lord and Savior knows more. In fact, the scripture says we have a great high priest who can identify with every single one of our needs. And the thing about that, and I've been stressing this the past few weeks, is that he chose it. He chose to do it on purpose for your behalf. He chose to come into the world as a frail human and suffer the death that we ought to have suffered so that we could be lifted up and saved. And so he deserves great praise for that. Would you please stand, if you're able, and join us in acknowledging how great that love is.
so much for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. It's grace that we can't repay, and so all we can do is surrender. All we can do is say to you today, we want to give you our everything, and we know, Lord, what you've asked of us is to take the hope you filled us with, even this morning, and to go out into a world that's lost and broken and hurting and share that same hope. Would you please empower us by your Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus, to do that as we go today. We pray and we ask this in the mighty and merciful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great week. Have a great week. Thanks. Feel